All right. Well, let's talk about the four teams who are in it. Obviously, UConn and Purdue, they've been two of the top teams in college basketball all season long. Seem like they are on a crash course for what would be one of the most anticipated finals in a long, long time. But first, Alabama and NC State waiting in the wings. Uh, let's begin with a look at this UConn-Alabama matchup, guys. I'm going to set the tone here a little bit. These are two coaches that know each other very, very well. Dan Hurley, when he was the coach at the University of Rhode Island, one of the most important recruits of his tenure was a guard from Michigan named E.C. Matthews. His high school coach was someone by the name of Nate Oates. Shortly after he committed to Rhode Island, Nate Oates joined the staff at Buffalo, where the head coach was named Bobby Hurley. When Bobby Hurley left for Arizona, Arizona State, Nate Oates became the head coach at Buffalo. He did so well, he was hired at Alabama. These two have a connection. They share thoughts analytically. I think they even work with the same third-party analytic company. At least I know they did in the past. So these are two teams that are now on a crash course uh, for what should be a very entertaining uh, semifinal game. Chris, I want to talk, talk to you first. Who do you like in this matchup and why? Listen, obviously the overall favorites, the overwhelming favorites, shall I, see, shall I say, will be UConn. I mean, let's just face it. Uh, they have every single thing that you need. Uh, they bust the seams on all the metrics, Klingon inside. I still don't know what Brad Underwood was thinking trying to attack Klingon uh, at all. Uh, but at the end of the day, they have Samson Johnson coming off the bench if Klingon happens to struggle or gets in foul trouble. So they have a situation where they have depth there. Diara coming off the bench, six man of the year in the Big East. They have depth, two of the best guards in the country. Cam Spencer and Trisha Newton. Newton, obviously, a first-team All-American. Uh, so they have every single thing. And Caravan, who I believe was their unsung hero last year, really still hasn't uh, really shown his ability uh, to do what he can do best. And he's a wild card uh, in a lot of ways, along with Stefan Castle, who pe people are predicting to be a lottery pick. I say all that to say this team seems to be unbeatable. I was challenged uh, on a set the other day saying, is it one of the most unbeatable teams ever? And I'm like, guys, like, you know, UNLV that lost to Duke in the Final Four. Uh, Georgetown, that that Villanova beat Georgetown in 85. There are some teams that people thought were in, you know, the Fly Slamma, the Fly Slamma Jamma team or or the Duke teams, uh, the Christian Leitner Duke teams that I thought were invincible. So comparing those teams to this UConn team who's going, has a chance to go back to back, it's tough for me knowing what I know. It's like talking about LeBron and Jordan. Like, that's tough for me in that argument you know what I'm saying? I, I just think that's premature too like let's get to tuesday like let, let's yes. talk about uconn and alabama first and then if we get past that we can talk about uconn and purdue or uconn and nc state and then if we get to tuesday and they're holding the trophy again then all of us talking heads can go on for months about whether this was the best uconn team or not but until they win two more games that conversation is premature that that's just my take and, and, um and also, yeah. on, and let me say this too, like in the world of college basketball is so different now. I'm not going to say it's easier to do what Danny's doing because but think about it. He wasn't picked in the top 25 last year, won the uh, NCAA tournament. He wasn't even picked to win the Big East last year, picked third. And he's looked like one of the most invincible teams ever. I think because of the landscape and you put the right roster together, certainly giving him credit, he can do it. But let me just make one comment about Alabama and, uh, and Nate Oates. Nate Oates, people don't realize or people forget, was the number one overall seat last year with Brandon Miller. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, like, there's no way he can duplicate or replicate the success of last year. And he takes Mark Sears, lose Kearney, I mean, and just lose a couple of the nice, really nice pieces. Uh, and and, and Jaden Bradley, who's at Arizona, uh, and Noah Clowney, and look what he's doing. And what I say is, and you spoke about analytics, I believe, and you know basketball is a copycat league, fast followers. The way he's playing with the three-point shot and the analytics, people laugh about it. But, guys, I'll tell you this. People say Alabama doesn't play defense. And you know what my response to that is? Okay, you know what the best defense is? Scoring 90. That's the best defense. So you can talk all you want about what they don't do guard-wise. And I'll say the last thing is in the SEC, they were the second-best two-point team percentage-wise as well. So it's a little bit fuddy-duddy. You get up and down. That's what hurt Carolina. You get up and down with them, and they can get these threes going. And as Jay Wright says, shoot them up and sleep in the streets. It's not. It's like golf. It's not how many. It's not how many. It's, how, it's that, I'm sorry. It's not how. It's how many. Even if they shoot a bad percentage, if they can get to 15 threes, look out, UConn, if you struggle like you did in the beginning of the Illinois game. 
All right, Isaac, what, what do you think about that? Well, you took the words right out of my mouth because I do think there's a number offensively that Alabama can get to with these threes. You know, UConn's won games and they're blowing everybody out. They haven't shot the ball very well from three-point range. So if, if we're getting to a gap there where Alabama gets that 13, 14, 15 three-pointer range and, and UConn has to make 30 points up in another area of the floor, that, that changes things. But for me, it really comes down to when Alabama misses threes because the secret sauce behind this Alabama offense has been their offensive rebounding. And UConn is phenomenal in transition those long shots long rebounds every time Alabama takes a three it's going to be a war on the glass because if UConn can get those loose balls and get those long rebounds it's a bucket on the other end because they run the floor and they don't just run the floor once in a while for all 40 minutes they sprint the floor and so if Alabama is able to get those offensive rebounds on those long shots on those threes and gets another opportunity I think that's where Alabama can start to make this game plan work because you have got to keep UConn out of transition or you have no hope I mean, listen, the three-point line is obviously an equalizer for Alabama with the amount they shoot. When they're going in, they're capable of beating anyone on any given night. We said that two weeks ago, uh, and it has come to fruition. But I think for me, the, the X factor in this game is Grant Nelson because we've seen two vastly different players here in the NCAA tournament. The first week of the tournament, he did nothing. He had three points in each of the first two rounds games, was essentially a non-factor. Now in the Sweet 16, that guy looked like a first round pick. He comes out, he's got 25, 11, and five, I think. And he shows at six foot 11 the versatility to pull opposing big men away from the basket because he was making shots, which is huge. We know everybody in Alabama's got the green light. He is going to be encouraged to shoot that ball against UConn and try and drag Donovan Klingon away from the basket. If Grant Nelson is making threes, it will open up a lot of things for Alabama. And don't forget, he is also a very good handler and passer. So he's going to try and attack Donovan Klingon off the dribble and see if he can get him in foul trouble. That's another subplot of this game. Does Nelson make threes and does he get Klingon in foul trouble? Two things to keep an eye on. Final thoughts on this game. Chris, you first with a pick on who will win. Listen, you took the words right out of my mouth about Grant Nelson, but they play small. And then don't, don't forget that a right cell will be available as well, who's their best percentage three-point shooter. So, again, it's going to be five out all game long. And, and I continue to say this. It happened with Marquette. It happened in other games. When you can't shoot the three, and some of these teams are very good. Deep, I'm sorry, they're so deep that they, like Purdue shot three for 15 and still beat Tennessee. I just don't believe that those type of uh, outputs defensively will happen again. Obviously, they had uh, 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 the big fella, ZD, you know, just take over the game. But I say that to say, and, and uh, um, the point was already made, by Zach is that if they struggle to shoot the basketball, I continue to tell people this is about matchups, both really good coaches. If they struggle to shoot the basketball, Alabama can get off to a really good start because the thing about Alabama is it can happen at any given time the same way it can happen for UConn. They're both explosive teams. I don't think UConn is going to meet a team that can be as explosive as Alabama. And I think you make the greatest point. If they don't rebound the basketball, I think uh, 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 if you don't, as Zach made it, you, if you don't rebound the basketball against this team, it's going to be a struggle to get Trisha Newton in transition because that's when he's best. And he didn't have a great game against Illinois. So for me, it comes down to UConn's dominance on the glass. And I don't think Nate Oates is going to be like Brad Underwood and have his ego in check. Say, hey, we're going to attack Donovan Klingon. He's going to say, we're going to pull Kling Kong out from the perimeter and he's going to have, and we're going to miss, miss, miss. And we're going to continue to shoot, shoot, shoot. That is our advantage. There is no other way we can win this game Right. And they're going to let Klingon throw it inside and let him shoot every single time because he's not as good as Zach Eady at scoring. So oh, I would that, take, yeah. and take away the shooters on a perimeter. And then again, if they get into a shootout match with Alabama and get out of character, which I don't think Danny will let them do, it's going to be like watching tennis going back and forth. And then in a fast game, a lot of people talk about UConn. I'm taking Alabama and attract me. I'm going to take Alabama. All right, Isaac, who you got? Yeah, I think it really comes down to how disciplined UConn is offensively because North Carolina got away from their bread and butter to start that second half. They did not drive the basketball. They shot a lot of threes and turned it into a jump shooting contest at the beginning of the second half. And that really burnt them. And I think if UConn is able to put pressure on the rim every single trip down the floor, like it paint touches, 
drives off the bounce, make these Alabama smaller guards defend multiple actions, make them fight through all of these screening actions that UConn is going to put them through, make them fight through the blender, right? Like that's what UConn puts you in, a blender. Can Alabama guard for 23, 24, 25 seconds without making a mistake that leads to a bucket inside? If UConn is able to get to the rim at will and continues with that game plan for all 40 minutes, I think UConn gets enough, has enough in the tank to get this one done. I'm just not willing to bet against UConn until somebody beats them. I, I said I think the, the game plan for Alabama to score the upset here is to make a lot of threes and get Grant Nelson going. For UConn, I think it's, it's a couple of things. And this is one point we haven't talked about yet. When you're guarding a team that wants to play drive and kick basketball, that wants to shoot a lot of threes and run their actions to get to the threes, it comes down to guarding your man without needing help. If UConn can defend Alabama, both off the dribble and in their actions, without requiring a secondary defender to come over and help and put themselves in long closeout situations, Alabama has a tendency to settle, settle for tough shots. UConn's got to make them guard, run their own stuff, as Isaac said, be disciplined offensively. Defensively, it's just important. They have to take pride in guarding their own man one-on-one, -on -one, not requiring that help, not getting into long closeout situations, which will result in those drive and kick threes. As long as that doesn't happen, like I said, I'm not betting against UConn until somebody beats them. All right, fellas, let's move on to the other end of the bracket. NC State, this year's Cinderella, although suddenly it is uh, no longer fashionable to use the word Cinderella, going against Purdue and Zach Eady. So, Isaac, I'm going to start with you on this one. I mean, is this just Purdue all the way, or what does Cinderella have to do to keep dancing here for Kevin Keats and the Wolfpack? Well, it's interesting. It's kind of weird because I feel like NC State sneakily matches up decently well with Purdue. Like, Purdue starts right. two bigs, and NC State starts two bigs. They have a lot of lead guards. NC State has a lot of lead guard defenders that are playing at a high level. So it's interesting, right? Ever since early February, since uh, Kevin Keats really changed the lineup up and got Mo DR in the starting lineup, this NC State offense ranks 25th nationally. So, like, they have really started to figure things out. Big part of that is obviously DJ Burns. But for me, it's the other side of the floor. NC State can't win this game unless you bottle up Purdue somehow. And NC State basically plays two different ball screen coverages. When DJ Burns is on the floor, he's in deep drop coverage. So I look at Braden Smith. He's going to get to that elbow jumper, and he's been knocking them down at will all game. But then when DJ Burns subs out, they bring, bring Ben Middlebrooks into the game, and he plays at the level. He could trap ball screens. He's really active. He's tough. He's physical. So it's just – it's. I feel like Purdue has to be really, really – discipline because you're going to see basically two different coverages depending on which big is on the floor and that's an angle and an interesting angle that Kevin Keats has up his sleeve all right Chris what do you got I mean Zach you miss your calling as a coach man I mean, you got a chance there uh, you know what's funny you watch when you play Purdue I'll, I'll make this comment about Cinderella in the era that we're in now Cinderella does not exist now I will say this NC State who in their right mind would think they would be Duke twice in the span of two weeks given Duke's brand but I made this comment before when they play Duke, it was the old heads at the park versus the young bucks, the wily young bucks. And what they have is they have a ton of transfers who do not see the name on the front of the Jersey. They see the name on the back. That's how experienced this team is. And they interviewed DJ Burns after the game. He says, he says, everyone's asking, what is the secret to the turn? He says, everybody start coming on time. And so, and like, he was saying stuff like he was being so honest. I'm like, so they may have had some issues in the locker room that they solved between older guys. And because they take transfers, it takes those guys a while to learn. And even the coaches in Kevin Keats, what am I working with? Mm -hmm. So now I fast forward that to now, there's no accident. They're doing what they're doing. They look like they're the better team when they play every single time, because they have a bunch of veterans out there that are playing like veterans. Now against this Purdue team, Again, you could say the coverage of DJ Burns, if he can't get in foul trouble, because that'll right. alter the game. Zach Eady never gets in foul trouble. The one thing that you mentioned before about Ben Biddlebrooks and Braden Smith coming off ball screens, and I'm sitting there like pulling my hair out if I had any. And I, and I know these guys are great coaches. I'm like, listen, the handoff and the ball screen is the same. They only they don't only do it for Braden Smith, they also do it for Fletcher Lawyer coming off with their right hand every single time and then if you help guess what they're going to do throw it up to the big fella so you can't help you have to trap that screen 
they have to talk about drop coverage with DJ Burns because they're going to kill them on that every single time. Because if he's in a drop and, and Braden's going downhill, what do you think Zach Eady's doing? He's coming right to the rim. So if DR or anyone helps, they're just throwing it up and there's nothing that anyone on earth can do in college basketball to stop it. They really have to talk through that. And again, I would guard Zach Eady the exact same way other than a couple possessions here that Tennessee did, let him get 40. And I always say this, it's not about him getting 40. The problem was that this guy, uh, Sakai Ziegler, played terrible, right? Jonas Adu played terrible. Every single guy. And and and, and jo Josiah Jordan-James played good, didn't get enough attempts. And uh, 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 Gate, I mean, uh, Jordan Ganey played good, made a couple shots, didn't get enough attempts. But the guys that they usually depend on, Baskerby, none of those guys did anything. That was the problem. You have to score. You can let Zach Eady get 40. Let him crush every record. Take away all the three-point shots and get back in transition. You win the game if you score. People forget that. They all. That's why I love Alabama. Everyone talks about defense. They forget you still have to score on the other end. So the best defense sometimes is scoring. You know what, guys? I want to I want to combine those two points because, Chris, to your point, other people are going to have to score. And, Isaac, you talked about that ball screen coverage. Braden Smith is going to have a ton of open looks because the most underappreciated part of Zach Eady's game, and we know he's been the most dominant college basketball player in the NCAA for the past two seasons, but the thing that we don't talk about is that he is a phenomenal screen setter. So you put DJ Burns back in the lane, and essentially it's a two-on-one up at the three-point line where Eady is crashing into whoever is guarding the Purdue, the Purdue guards. They're going to get to that elbow. They're going to have, whether it's pull-ups from the elbow, somebody goes under the screen, they're going to have those threes. If they can make... Those NC, that NC State pay for that coverage, that is going to go a long way towards opening up the game for everyone else on Purdue and potentially draw NC State into a different type of coverage. Chris was saying they need to trap, but that that to me is a first domino in how these coaches handle this chess match. When Burns is going soft coverage and he comes up and sets a monster screen, if Purdue's guards are making shots, how does NC State counter? All right, final point. Chris, who are you taking in this one? Listen, I got to go with Purdue. I mean, it's a des team of destiny. Uh, Matt, Matt Painter has been much maligned. I've been one of them that's jumped on them, uh, and I'm happy for his success. I love Kevin Keats and that story. I know much is going to be made about Balvano, but in this industry, when you – and it's just a one-and-done industry. It's a tough industry. Transfer portal, you guys covered a lot. It is very difficult to amass a team. And as I mentioned about – uh, Nate Oates. Now, I know I think last year, you guys correct me, next year is the last year of the COVID seniors because there are COVID seniors on NC State's team. You know, the question is, what will be the model after that? Because this has significantly, significantly helped NC State get to where they are. And a lot of people don't realize that they look at Alabama's roster with Grant Nelson, with Mark Sears, Aaron Estrada, with Wright Sale. All those guys are transfers. Yeah. And that has helped those two teams get to the Final Four similarly the way it helped San Diego State, State last year. I say that to say the most complete team, the deepest team, with the force inside and the three-point shooting, I'm taking Purdue. All right. Isaac, who you got? Yeah, it's funny, right? NC State, all, all transfers. Purdue has one transfer. It's just a very different team's build. I think it's a really good example that you can build teams in different ways and have success in the modern era. But give me Purdue in this spot. And the other aspect that I was really looking at, too, is Trey Kaufman-Ren. I think he's going to have a big imprint on this game, the four-man for Purdue. He is terrific in post-up opportunities. NC State very rarely doubles post-ups. I think he's going to have some really interesting matchups one-on-one when they give Zach Eady a break. Trey Kaufman-Ren is proven to be a really, really impactful back-to-the-basket big man. He's going to, If he can give them eight to ten points, I think that's a game-changer for them. Simply put, honestly, I just feel like there's way more – avenues for Purdue to score on NC State than vice versa. So just give me the best team here. I feel like we're on a collision course for Purdue and UConn. I think we get it. I, I would agree with you. And as I've said, I don't know, I've, I've been saying it for the last month repeatedly. This is a Purdue team that is vastly different from last year's team. Last year's team started two freshmen in the backcourt. Those freshmen are now sophomores. Last year's team was not a good three-point shooting team. This year's team leads the country in three-point shooting. Last year's team was very slow. One of the slowest teams in college basketball. This year's team, even though they're playing inside out with Edie, is about middle of the pack in tempo, and they still have the most dominant big man, the most dominant player in all of college basketball. So just like I said about UConn, I'm picking Purdue until someone beats them. That would set us up for this much-anticipated final. 
And guys, we got to be real quick with this one. If it comes down to Purdue versus UConn, Chris, give me your 20-second winner. I mean, I'm glad, obviously I'm going to go with the Big East. I'm going with Danny Hurley and UConn. That's going to be a phenomenal game. Z Mount E.D. versus Kling Kong. And it's going to be a throwback to the old college basketball. But I'm taking the depth of uh, UConn and the Big East. Isaac, who you got? I would take UConn in that one, too. I think Cam Spencer and Tristan Newton outplay Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer. Barely. All right. I, the thing I will say about this Donovan Klingon Zach Eady matchup, and this is for the fans out there. A lot of people are asking me if Zach Eady is the best player in college basketball, how is Donovan Klingon now considered the best NBA prospect? The thing for fans to know is that while they are both massive, while Eady is probably, as Chris pointed out early, the more dominant interior scorer in the college game, what differentiates them for NBA purposes is the mobility factor. Klingon runs the floor exceptionally well. He reacts quicker on the defensive end. He's got more agile hips. And it's that mobility factor, along with the potential away from the basket offensively, that really differentiates those two players. I wanted to make that point quick because that's a question that has come up for the people who are just starting to tune into March Madness and saying, hold on, Edie's dominating, but Klingon's atop the draft boards. Why is that? So we wanted to break that down quickly for those fans. Having said that, I do think Edie would be a tough head-to-head -head matchup for Klingon if they meet on Monday night. And so to Isaac's point, I think UConn's guards will have to counter and come up in a big way. But it is, uh, is going to be a lot of fun beginning this Saturday night in Phoenix with the finals tipping off on Sunday. Remember, it all gets going. NC State taking on Purdue. The tip is scheduled for 6.09 p.m. Eastern time and Alabama facing UConn at 849.